Hello everyone, welcome back to Live in the Wellness Garden. I am your garden coordinator, Andreas. Hello. And that is Brianna. Yes. <laughs> so let's let's uh let's do a little walkthrough before we get started. We're gonna be doing spring planting today. Um so you guys remember the cover crops we sowed last week? Uh, for those of you who were able to actually catch the live before my phone overheated and it got depleted. <laughs> well, here they are. They're looking pretty good. They're coming up. Yay. Here we go. Warm season cover crops initiated. So I'm seeing some brassicas coming up right there. Uh, I'm seeing some nasturtium probably from last season. We're going to leave those. Um, I'm seeing some buckwheat right there. Um... I am seeing some grasses. Where are the grasses? Ooh, look at that. I'm not sure what that is. That might be cow peas or guar beans. Oh, what's that? Those are, that's nasturtium, um, brassicas. Uh, then here's one of the grasses. Uh, we have, um, I think we have like a um, millet and sorghum sudan grass in here. I know I put sorghum sudan grass in the mix. Oh, and this looks like a sunflower. We'll leave the sunflower. Sunflowers are really mycorrhizal, which means they form associations with the beneficial mycorrhizal fungi in the soil, uh, which builds soil. Oh yeah, here's one right here. This one looks like it's having a tough time. Let's let's give it some uh, some help. There you go, little guy. <laughs> now we're gonna need to give this a nice watering today uh, to make sure we get good germination. But it looks like everything is coming up pretty nicely. Um, yep, uh, everything else looks good. Uh, strawberries are perking up. We're getting a lot right here. Look at all those. Beautiful. Um, our beans are coming in nicely. More beans. This is my first year trying square foot gardening and I really like it. Oh yes, that's right, Brianna. We got this. Sunflower. Beautiful. <laughs> this came up on its own and... Yep, a volunteer. A volunteer is a plant that comes up on its own. There's some more sunflowers. It's shading the sage there in the middle. Oh yeah, but I think sage likes sun, so um, we might need to chop and drop these soon. We'll see. Um, yeah, everything's looking great. The Mediterranean herbs love the compost tea. That's what I think, at least. They just look so good this year. Um, and we have so many peas. Like, we have peas coming out the wazoo right now. It's great. Look at all these. They're so good. Mm -hmm. Since we've been getting some warmer weather, they've really sweetened up and the sugar content has really developed. They're so delicious. Mm. The hydro system looks good. This is the nano farm system. Wow, look at that lettuce. That's like that auric is going crazy. Yeah, this this lettuce is ready. It's it's all good now. Uh, so I actually might take a head today. Uh, and the miner's lettuce looks good too. Doesn't like the heat, but it's growing. That's wonderful. Yep, and uh, everything else looks great. We have tons of chamomile right now. We're going to harvest these. Um, they smell so good. Chamomile. Here's our seedlings for today. We're going to be doing spring planting. And then I just wanted to uh, show the uh, winter cover crops, or the end of them. Cool season cover crops, technically. They look really good. No fertilizer. It's hot, Alondra. It's, it's definitely like in the 80s. Um, I'm, I'm feeling the heat, but yeah, these look fantastic. So this soil is now going to be nice and primed, uh, for everything we're going to put in. Uh, we're going to do that one next and this one. Um, fruit trees look great too. They, they responded well to the fertilizer we gave them the other week. Look at them. They look amazing. We're going to have so many lemons this year. It's going to be crazy. Look at this on every branch. We have like at least like half a dozen lemons like on each end like we have like half a dozen lemons did you add compost tea to this to the trees too yes i did i applied wow. compost tea as a foliar onto the trees they love it everything loves compost tea <laughs> i love the vetch flowers they're so cute anyways i have to agree the cover crops they're beautiful nice. they are beautiful and they attract so many beneficial insects like this hoverfly right here this is an, this thing right here, I'm not sure if you can see it. Oh yeah, you can kind of see it right there. You see that thing? That's called a hoverfly. That is an aphid consuming machine right there. More than ladybugs do. Yeah, is, is that true? Yeah. 
Oh yeah? I saw it on like an Instagram post. It was like, oh, that's oh, cool. Did you know hoverfly larvae eat, eat them like, I forgot how many more times than ladybugs. Yeah. Well, uh, we terminated these guys last time, didn't we? Wasn't that last time? Yeah. Uh, so this is a week later. I had to go in and, and make uh, two more passes to make sure everything was all done for. But uh, let's take a look at the soil now. Like, look at this, it looks amazing. How do you build soil? With plants, with living roots. That's the best way to do it. So now we've got some really nice soil and we're gonna plant. So here's what we got. We got some okra. We got some uh, various kinds of squash and we've got some amaranth. And later on, we're actually gonna be planting jicama in here. I'm really excited for that. So jicama is actually a legume. So what we're doing here is basically a modified version of the Three Sisters system. Because this is too small of a space to plant corn. You won't get good pollination in this kind of space. But instead, we can sub in okra and amaranth. Because okra grows nice and tall. This amaranth grows to about three feet. I think it's more of a bushy variety, but it'll still work really well, I think. Um, so uh, the seedlings look a bit uh, worse for wear. They've been in my table for too long. We were trying to let the cover crops go um, a bit longer, but I think they'll be fine. Uh, so as long as we're really careful while we're planting them, I think they'll be good. Um, and we're also going to pop some sunflowers in here and some other flowers on the ends, because uh, it's always good to have some flowers. <laughs> watermelon, right? Watermelon? No watermelon here. Oh. Okay. Um, but we'll do we'll do watermelon elsewhere, like in there. Anyways, uh, do you want to uh, hold the phone, Brianna, and uh, we'll get started? Um, let's let's make sure that... Uh, it doesn't overheat. And, yeah, it doesn't overheat again. Uh, I'm, I'm trying I'm, to shade it with my hand. Yeah. So that way you guys could stay... Uh... Yeah, you know what? Actually, let me take off the case. Oh, okay. Um, the, because the, the case makes it worse, for sure. I know, a cool rag would be nice. We do have rags here, so uh, let me actually get you one okay. uh, if you want to. Meanwhile, uh, I'll show the phacelias. Yeah, didn't we, we did not show the phacelias. No. The phacelias. Yes, and I just learned today that there's such thing as native bees. I thought bees were bees, but there's native ones, and they're super tiny. You could kind of see it. It's like a little mini black bee and apparently they're native um so that's just amazing to see all the wonderful life that's happening here oh, yeah, looks and beautiful. look at these trouble. sugar snap peas they're they're, they're on their last leg but that's okay um yeah. i was so, trying to show uh, the native bee so phacelia is actually in the same family as borage oh, the yeah. same look, there's one yeah, there, there's another one they're all over the place yeah that's amazing and uh, Phacelia, however, is native to California. So you're gonna attract all the native pollinators with this. And it pretty much grows and serves the same exact function as borage. So if you wanna grow a native plant that's like borage in your garden, grow Phacelia. Uh, this is Phacelia tanacidifolia, tansy lead Phacelia. <laughs> it's so beautiful. Look at how it curls. It looks like a caterpillar flower. I know, flower. they're like caterpillar flowers. <laughs> and uh, they're actually uh, more drought hardy than borage, I believe. So it'll survive the hot. Yeah, you can see how well it's doing now. Um, they're used to this, and and look at how big they get. They get much bigger than Borge. Yeah, it's about as tall as as tall as Andreas right now. I mean, granted, they're two feet off the ground, but yes, wonderful nice natives. Oh yeah, wonderful natives. Okay. Anyways, so um, what are we gonna be planting again? So amaranth, okra, uh, various kinds of squash, and uh, later on we'll be planting hickam. Let's be so direct sowing to them Okay. So uh, let's start with the okra. Um, I tried to do even amounts of uh, Jing okra and uh, Clemson okra, but I ended up with one Jing and three Clemsons. <laughs> um, I think the Jing seeds were pretty old. That's okay. Uh, so we'll do one, two, three, four okra. Um, so let, what I like to do is, is invert. Are we going to add the co the compost or that's after? Oh, yes, that's right. we got to add the compost. <laughs> the compost. Thank okay. you for reminding me, Brianna. I remember so you said compost and mulch. Compost. Right. Look at that beauty. Yep, just, uh, so rich. Just kind of broadcast it. You don't need that much compost. Because what you're really adding here is, is microbes. This soil already has more than enough organic matter. 
Yeah, so that is came from, just to kind of like give some background on compost, it came from different food scraps. I brought in some food scraps, Andreas did, and um, just some dried leaves. And it was in our big tumbler and Andreas sifted it out. Yep, composting is alchemy. It's alchemy for your soil. What is alchemy? Alchemy is taking one thing and turning it into another. It was <laughs> kind of like the precursor to like chemistry in the Middle Ages. Yes. And I'm, I'm like really into like fantasy literature and games and stuff. Mm -hmm. So I like to think of composting as alchemy. Because you're like uh, taking, you know, trash and turning it into gold, into black gold. <laughs> so yes, someone said they're is. so excited to see this compost. Yes, this is it. It looks like wonderful. We've been this stuff for months and we finally got to harvest it. Yes, it's like eggshells. Yeah, this stuff in there. really good for the soil. And keep in mind with compost, not all composts are created equal. Quality matters. So make sure you're making good compost, make sure you're doing it the right way. Otherwise, you could actually hurt your plants. Yeah. But there's lots of life in here. It smells pretty good. Hmm. I think that this is like medium quality compost. You could definitely make better compost than this. Uh, I've heard that the best way to comp to make compost is uh, actually with this thing called a Johnson Sioux bioreactor. Mm -hmm. And it's like a big uh, cylinder that you build and you fill it up with like material and put like these pipes in it for air. And then you just let it go for like six months and don't turn it at all. I've seen those like solar panel. Have you seen them? They like turn on their own. Solar panel? Yeah. Like, like a compost? solar panel compost tumbler. No, I've not seen those. That sounds pretty cool. Yeah. I mean, tumblers are all right. Um, you're going to be able to get a very bacterial compost with tumblers. Um, which method which is do you be use? Good for like annual vegetables. But if you want something for fruit trees, make leaf mold com make leaf mold compost. That's what's over there, right? No, that's not leaf mold compost. That's oh. cold compost, but leaf mold compost is a specific type of cold composting. Uh, where you're actually taking shredded leaves and you're just letting them sit for like six months to a year. Just keeping them moist and letting all the fungi grow in them and Ooh, eat them up. And then you'll see the white uh, fungi on there. Yep. And that's what trees really like. Looks so wonderful seeing all these flowers in the background back there. Yeah, these pollinator boxes look beautiful right now. If any of those plants finish off, I'm definitely going to replace them with natives. <laughs> I would love to get some native sages going in there. Like some uh, Cleveland sage, some white sage, some black sage. Mm -hmm. Wonderful plants, uh, wonderful herbs. Uh, some of the, a lot of the native sages you can actually eat. Um, and also there are host plants uh, for uh, nectar plants for monarch butterflies. All the native sages. You know what I saw someone do once? They had sage smudge sticks and they were burning them like it was when it was very um the weather it was very like overcast and like misty mm -hmm. lots of fog and they were burning sage near the trees. Does that help to like cleanse or clear out the trees? Or it's anything? a spiritual practice. Oh. You know, I'm okay. not sure about that. I mean it's an indigenous spiritual practice that has become very fashionable nowadays. I thought it was like, reason. I thought it was to prevent any like disease from the tree or something. I don't know. I'm not sure if that's effective. Um, I would see what the, what the scientists are saying about it. Someone asked, do y'all build the boxes yourselves? The boxes were built a long time ago by PPM, right? I'm not sure. I actually um, don't know. By our physical plant management, but you can build the boxes yourselves. Yeah. I didn't build these, uh, and I know Brianna did not build these, did you? No. So uh, <laughs> They were here prior to yeah, us. They've been but... here for, since 2016, as far as I know. Yeah. Um, I think that's good. What do you think? Are you going to get some plants in? You're going to save that? Yeah, we'll save the rest. We'll or shake it. it on there, or just... We'll use it elsewhere. It won't dry out, or get... Oh, well, we're going to use it today. Oh, okay. Um... Yes, and thank you for reminding me to uh, plant the, uh, um, to put the compost on first. So here's our <laughs> ochre. Uh, yeah, these root systems are kind of weak, so. 
We're going to be very careful. So I'm going to put one on the end right here, and the hickam is going to be right there. This is worth it, Look at that soil. It's just so beautiful. Mm -hmm. Hopefully these this ochre likes it. I'm sure it will. The cover crops just do so much for your soil. It's amazing, really. Best we way. We can take a break. I'll, you could plant some and then switch. Yeah, um, I'll do the okra and then uh, I'll do two okra and you do two okra. How does that sound? Good. The amaranth is going to be tough because uh, those are very tiny. Uh, they, they, I don't think they like being raised in aquaponics, honestly, because all of these were started in aquaponics. The system is a little bit out of whack right now, but but once they get into this beautiful living soil, mm -hmm. I'm sure they'll be better. So okra, it grows like a like a large, it looks like a green, long bean type of thing, right? It's actually in the um, in the mallow family, same family as apples and uh, um, that kind of stuff. And hibiscus, I believe. I always get confused between okra and loofa, but loofa looks more like a squash. Loofa is in the squash family. Okay. Yeah, these are a bit tiny, so worst comes to worst. Oh! Oh no! That at least that wasn't a seedling. Yeah. Now, worst comes to worst, we'll get it. We'll get seedlings, um, or we'll direct. So. You know what? I have faith in these. We can't think I that do way. Too. And you know, I They're think let's let's give them some. Let's give them a chance. Let's to, give them a chance <laughs> to come up. Take off. So the soil temperature in here is is really good. It's it's nice and cool and moist. And this these cover tops just like totally turbocharged the soil. Mm -hmm. They're the best thing ever you can do for your soil is cover crops. Someone asked, what is aquaponics? Aquaponics is a soilless method of cultivation where you are growing fish and plants at the same time. Mm -hmm. Are we going to have some, I can't remember, some aquaponics videos coming out or no? Um, we are going to have a hydroponics video coming out soon, okay. but uh, we can do aquaponics videos. It's just tough because like the system we have here is really small. Right. It's, it's a very tiny system and you can't do much of it, but, and it's, it's being used for research. I'm excited for mine. Oh home. yeah, I'm going to build you one. Um, <laughs> we'll, we'll talk about that after the live stream. Yeah. Because I, I want to get you a design soon, but I've been very busy. Yes. The aquaponics is sort of my area of specialty. Look at those roots. You see how there's soil clinging to the roots? Mm -hmm. Those are called rhizosheaths. That's where the process of, of building and enriching soil actually happens in the rhizosheath which are in the rhizosphere the area yeah, directly around the roots so when you have when you see that in your soil like when you pull up a plant and like there's all of this uh look a peanut no way oh my gosh a peanut, peanut oh wow and yes fish and look at the grub look at this guy this is living soil see i always thought I don't know. It's probably a myth again oh, because you're there, teaching me that all that, bugs... that bug is a pest. That looks like I've a always stink. heard that the grubs are like that might bad. Be like a carpet beetle or something. I don't think the grubs are bad necessarily. Oh, you were gonna do the okra. My bad. It's okay. I could plant the other stuff. Yeah. Why don't you do the squash? That'll be pretty easy. Because I, I want to do the amaranth because they're they're gonna be uh, delicate. These guys are so tiny and delicate right now. Yeah. The seeds are so small. But we'll, we'll mulch after, um, that's the idea, is, is we're going to uh, transplant and then mulch. I'm trying to disturb the roots here as little as possible in the meantime. Okay. But, you know, that's going to be a bit of a challenge. <laughs> yes. Because these plants, these, this amaranth is just so, so tiny. Yeah, I didn't know you could start seeds in an aquaponic system. Yeah. I mean, you see that thing, right? That's our hydroponic table. The aquaponic ones work exactly the same way. So it's okra, amaranth, okra, amaranth. Mm -hmm. And then jicama. You see how like I'm putting everything on the left side? Mm -hmm. Hickama is going to be in front, and hickama is a vine in the bean family. It's going to vine up. The hickama uh, leaves and, and bean pods it makes are poisonous, but the roots are edible. The roots is what we see, right? The, yeah, the roots that's like a want. big brown. Yep. The big round thing is the, is the roots, the tuber or whatever. 
I'm not sure if it's actually a tuber technically, but. I just think this is so this cool. This good, I think these plants are gonna do the great. The peanut. This, this is, this is <laughs> some of the best soil I've ever seen in a raised bed. And uh, we learned recently that uh, when this soil was originally put in, it's actually 50% imported native soil, which is what you want to do. You want to get native soil in your raised bed, not just some planting mix you buy. Because native soil is what has all the minerals locked in it. And it's your biology, your life in the soil, that unlocks those minerals for your plants. The kind in the, rhizos in the rhizosphere. The kind that they sell at the stores is usually just potting, right? Not native? No, it's just potting mix. They might put some sand in it, but... So let's say I wanted to get native soil for my beds. Where would I go? Uh, like soil companies have it, I think. That's what Ruben told me, that our uh, friend at Physical Plant Management. Ruben is Look the at homie. That. All right. That's wonderful. There we go. So, amaranth, okra, amaranth, okra, amaranth, okra, amaranth, okra. Looks good. So I'll give you the lay of the land here. You know what? Since there's so many of these, why don't I do this? Um. So uh, I'll do these ones first. So okay. um, right here, I got some pumpkin. Ooh. We're gonna put the pumpkin over here. I planted some pumpkin at home too. Now these will be a lot easier to get out. You see, that's they're nice and uh, compacted. The, 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 the root systems are nice and developed, so the, uh, the pumpkin can go right. I'm gonna tease it out. We'll, we'll definitely need to uh, give these guys a bit of uh, seaweed extract. But this this soil is just, just, just like so well structured now, mm -hmm. and, and like it's so alive that I think it'll be great. There's our pumpkin. How long do you think it's going to take to harvest the pumpkin? Actually, you know what? Um, we'll, we'll vine it off right there. Um, uh, the pumpkins will be ready in the fall, I think. Yeah. Uh, then we have uh, my uh, family's heirloom Cypriot squash. Is that the Cypriot squash? This is the Cypriot squash. Whoa. And I've been really excited to plant this here. This, this, this variety has been in my family for generations. Yeah, I've never heard of a, It's such a fantastic variety of squash, very similar to a butternut. Um, I still have some seeds, so we're going to uh, get this in here. This soil is just so amazing. It would be so cool, maybe when things, when people are allowed to be on campus yeah. more, to do like yeah. a seed, um, a seed exchange. Oh yeah, I love that. <laughs> Okay, so here's what we got here, Brianna. Um, so this is zucchini. Uh -huh. um, you can see these four are uh, summer squash. Um, and then these are also zucchini. So what yeah, I would I like to do... Yeah, let's let's keep this in here. The summer squash. So let's do summer squash, zucchini, summer squash, zucchini, and then zucchini, summer squash, all the way down. Okay. Alternating. And then we'll put it in the center. Okay, just make um, sure you shade it like this. So, uh... Yeah, there we go. You Thank you. Break. Yeah, there you go. Okay, you said zucchini. Yes, fish. Um, not there. Not here? here? That's, we're going to put sunflowers there. Oh, okay. This one? Yep. Zucchini? Yeah, let's do zucchini there. There will be lots of bugs in there because it's living soil. I've been gardening for so long, but bugs still like still get My phone doesn't feel too hot yet. <laughs> I definitely might want to get a wet rag. Yeah, I don't think you really need to tease the roots out, but I yeah, don't press them in too hard. There you go. Looks good. And what we'll do is when they get established, we'll 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 keep the strongest one and and uh, cut off the other one at soil level and let the roots decompose in the soil. Zucchini, right? Um, let me see. Um, it looks like it, yeah. Yeah, it's zucchini. Maybe you could share a little bit about zucchini. I love growing zucchini. It's very easy to grow. Um, produces well. Just just make sure uh, 
um, you keep it well pruned uh, because it can get uh, fungal diseases on the leaves, especially powdery mildew, very easily if you don't keep it pruned. So make sure you keep your zucchini pruned. Should I leave this here? Um, sure, I guess. <laughs> okay, and these ones are summer squash? Yeah, so uh, the other, there, all those other ones over there are zucchini. Actually, that one kind of looks, these two look like summer squash. Zucchini and summer squash look exactly the same until they start producing. Okay, I believe you then. Look at this. We're going to look back on this live stream and then see how flourishing it becomes. And yep. I love that. Like looking back at videos when things were just seedlings. Yeah. You feel all those roots that are still in the soil? Yeah. That's what we want. See, I always thought keeping roots in there was like bad. No, that's a myth. I thought it was gonna like, in, like interfere with the rest of the roots from your plants. And... No, what's gonna happen now is those roots are going to decompose and the beneficial bacteria and fungi that are on them will now colonize those roots of our plants, the new plants. So, um, that is a myth. Yep. We wanna keep living roots in the soil for as long as possible if we want to maintain good biology. Otherwise, we're gonna to have to play catch up with fertilizers, with pesticides, with all the stuff that, you know, especially the pesticides. You know, some people are cool with applying fertilizers, you know, but you, it's not something you really have to rely on. There's a much cheaper way of doing it. <laughs> Regenerative agriculture is the cheapest way to grow food. <laughs> Nothing there, right? No, that's sunflowers. So then the next zucchini's there? Yep. This makes me so happy. We're doing it. This is happening, you guys. Then we'll just mulch around everything with wood chips. And then water it in. Look at that soil. Look at that. It's beautiful. You could feel it. It's like, I'm just amazed because it's so hot today and it's so moist. It's so here. cool and so moist. That's living soil. Soil is an ecosystem. It is a living thing. It is a super organism. It is the basis of all terrestrial life. And when we understand soil and how it actually works, we can grow a, product, a productive and wonderful garden without having to spend that much money. I don't apply fertilizer in my garden. I maintain the soil. have this natural mulch here from the cover crops. Yep. You can compost that stuff too. You don't have to leave it on the top of the bed. But we're going to try doing this. Yeah, you can... Oh my gosh, another peanut. Yeah. I didn't even know there was peanuts that were... I'd love to grow peanuts again here. Peanuts are so much fun. They seem like a lot of fun. So are they at the roots or at the top? Uh, so peanuts actually grow in a very interesting way. What they do is... They grow like kind of like bush beans, but then when they finish flowering, the flowers kind of like dive head first into the soil and the peanuts develop there. It's really crazy. Uh, there's another thing I want to grow here called Bombara bean that does like the exact same thing ex except as a perennial. I would try not to step on the soil if you can, that's okay. going to compact it. <laughs> like now that the cover crops are terminated, we kind of don't want to do that. Like we want to minimize the amount of trampling and compaction and compression. So now my question is where are the other summer squash? What did I do with them? There's four right there, but we need four more, don't we? I thought I had them here. Do I not? Let's go see. This is the hydroponic uh, seedling table. Uh, there will be a video coming out showing you how to build these. Let's see. Now, this is watermelon, cucumber, and... Uh, nope. Goodness, what did I do with them? Did I leave them at home? I must have. Well, that's okay. I'll bring them tomorrow, and I will plant them tomorrow. So... I hope I started enough. I thought I did. If not, I'll go buy some. I'm gonna take a little water break. Yeah, please do. Don't don't overheat. Let's let's go over here. Um, yeah, take a water break. I should too. After you're done. Hydroponics. Looking good. We need to get something in there. We got to start seeds. We're gonna do that today. Here's the aquaponics that somebody asked. 
Let's see if we can see the sloppy in there. No oh, fishies. Oh, there's one. You see him, the big guy? That's a tilapia. We keep the water nice and toasty for them. You see the water gets pumped up from the fish tank into this bed? No soil. This is clay. These are clay balls. Uh, they sort of cook them in this big rotary kiln and they puff up like popcorn. They're super, super light. And they're really good at uh, transferring water and nutrients or allowing for the transfer of water and nutrients. And they're also really good for hosting the beneficial biology that this kind of system depends on to turn the fish waste into fertilizer because that's what you're doing here. You're taking the, the pee and the poop that the fish make and you're pumping it up into this bed. Uh, you have bacteria living in here that turn it into fertilizer and then the fertilizer feeds the kale. And your kale grows twice as fast as in soil, something like that. In practice, I find that it's like one and a half to two times as fast, but you see this is the aquaponic kale. This is the hydroponic kale where we're just adding fertilizer. And this is the stuff that we're growing in soil. And you can see, you can see how much bigger the stuff in aquaponics is. And don't get me wrong, the stuff in soil looks great and it does well, but the aquaponic kale is twice the size and all of these beds were planted at the same time. And we are getting some pest issues. It looks like we have uh, some cabbage moth larvae, you know, those white butterflies. I've been seeing them around the garden lately. Seems like we have a bit of a uh, deficiency in uh, parasitoid wasps that deal with the larvae. So that means that there are not enough flowers that attract these insects in this part of the garden. So what I'm thinking is, in this hydro system, we'll plant some flowers. And you know, these plots are re for research, so we're doing a monoculture. Um, and uh, I'm gonna suggest maybe for the next round of research we put some companion plants in here. I think that'll be helpful. But yeah, that's aquaponics, hydroponics, and soil. So here we're using the fish for nutrients, there's no soil. Here we're just using some fertilizers, just like chemical fertilizers. Um, and uh, here uh, we're using uh, organic fertilizers for soil. Um, and uh, we mulched. Mulching is good because it keeps the soil underneath nice and moist and of good quality. This is good soil too. Not as good as the soil that was improved by the cover crops. Not nearly as good, but it's also quite good. So yeah, our cover crops from last week look great, once again. They're getting lots of sun now. We're gonna give them a drink later uh, when it's not too hot and the sun is starting to go down. Um, and uh, they will do quite well. And they're going to build this soil back up. Uh, this soil was exhausted. These are warm season cover crops, actually. And uh, we put uh, around 20 species in here, I think. Um, and uh, they're just going to grow like this pretty much. Uh, but they're gonna grow a lot taller. And that's a good thing because they're going to be able to work a lot harder than the cool season cover crops. And so they're really going to improve this soil. I'm really excited to see what it looks like in the fall uh, when these are done. And some of these are edible too. Uh, like uh, for example, um, right over uh, here, uh, I believe that is buckwheat and you can harvest the seeds and eat those. So uh, buckwheat is really good for making phosphorus available in the soil. Uh, so if you're having a phosphorus problem in your soil and you wanna do a cover crop, plant buckwheat. And buckwheat does really well in the spring and summer. Hey, little bird. <laughs> We're done with the squash? Yeah. So there was no more uh, summer squash? No, so we got this whole line. We just need some for the other side. What is this right here? Oh, is that squash? Yeah. Oh, I didn't Yeah, this is summer squash. So this is the rest of it. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know why I misplaced those. Um, they were hiding. We're you want me to do these? Sure. I'll do them. Sure, sure. Yeah, really stoked for this bed. Yeah, the plants look sickly right now, but they should bounce back. We're gonna we're gonna pamper them. We're gonna give them a lot, plenty of water, and uh, a little bit of seaweed extract to stimulate root growth. I also might prune back some of the leaves a bit mm -hmm. uh, because they're gonna go into shock. That's pretty much guaranteed you, at this let point. Let me know if you need a shovel. Um, so we wanna. But this, this soil is really nice. So I think they'll be right at home once they get a step. Leave a little well for them. And 
and uh, the uh, all the residue from the cover crops will help retain moisture and return fertility to the soil over the course of the entire season. Because a lot of what we were growing here is uh, legumes, very rich in nitrogen. Oh, there's still some roots in the soil. Let's pull these out. Oh, these these are the uh, wheat. This is the wheat, the winter wheat that was in here. You see that? Mm-hmm. All the soil stuck to the roots. That's those, called the. A... Those are the rhizo sheaths. And whenever you see rhizo sheaths in your soil, mm -hmm. you have healthy soil and soil is being built. Because um, these rhizo sheaths are actually produced by bacteria and fungi that, that make these sticky compounds, these glues and, and, and these... Uh, is that what roots are made like out that. of? Uh, no, it's around the roots. Oh, okay. Um, and and they're, they're actually taking soil particles and binding them to the roots. And this is where the exchange of nutrients and uh, be, between the plant and, and the... Uh, soil microbiome physically happens is the rise of sheep. <laughs> it's funny how like this is where this is all new like, science. It's coming from this is where our gut microbiome. I think that connection is so cool. Like to it learn so more cool. about that. It's like from our, food. our gut microbiome is is this new thing. Well, not a new thing in us, but it's new to science and stuff. And people are trying to figure out like yeah. So is all this stuff like living soil. That's very new science. And, like, and so this is where it comes from. Look it comes that. from the look soil where our food grows. Those, this soil is being held together by roots with rhizosheaths on them. Roots bind soil together and prevent it from eroding. Uh-oh. Someone's got an issue. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, these look pretty good. And I think they'll, they'll establish pretty well. I have high hopes for these. This looks so beautiful. Yeah, once, once it gets going, I think we'll be good. I'm so excited to finally plant this bed out and see how the cover crops uh, have improved the soil for these. I think I'm gonna cry. I'm gonna, gonna cry, cry when things start. <laughs> when we get our first squash and our first okra, I'm gonna oh, cry. Yeah. Cause All it's right. just, it's a beautiful thing. Oh, this soil thing. is so beautiful. All right, wonderful. That's it. Here's an overview, modified. Three sisters, y'all. So yeah, we're gonna mulch this now. Okay. So I got wood chips already. So let me take a water break. Yes. It's really hot today. Look at this cilantro growing. Cilantro is bolting. Yes. You know, cilantro attracts your friends, the parasitoid wasps. So if you if you if you know you, that you tend to have aphid problems in the spring, plant cilantro in the winter. Let some of it go to flower. Leave it in. It's going to attract the wasps that are going to get rid of the aphids. Yes, and I also learned dill as well. Yes. Dill is another thing you can grow. Anything in the carrot family. Ooh, what is this thing? Let me see. It's black and orange. Oh. Oh, that's actually a, a ladybug nymph. A ladybug larva. Oh. The ladybugs love the chamomile here. Yes, they do. I'm, I'm gonna Look at how beautiful that out. is. We have to take some of it out today. But you know what? We'll make tea out of it. I'm gonna take I'm gonna take it out uh, next week. Never mind. Yeah, and um, yeah, the the one who's doing the herb dehydration, she could use some of it. Yeah, we we have the herbs are gonna do really well this year. I know that. Um, and uh, that square bed, bed number five over there. Uh huh. Cover crops in it. Uh, yes. That one is gonna be all herbs. What kind of herbs? Uh, mugwort, pissed off. Uh, maybe a couple natives. Um, really good stuff. Um, I want to do some uh, spilanthes or toothache plant in there too. Look at this. That's wonderful. I forgot what is mugwort good for again? Um, it is good for anxiety, promoting uh, dreams, and uh, menstrual issues. <laughs> okay. I'm not making any medical claims. Right. <laughs> He's not making any medical claims, but it's just interesting to see all these different new. <clears throat> I have Potential. anecdotally found that mugwort tea is good for calming nerves and reducing anxiety. Anecdotally. I think that's a common thing too uh, with a lot of teas. You know, it's very soothing. Lavender tea as well. Lavender. I really love chamomile tea at night. So. It's nice to see the jujube tree leaping out too. Oh yes, jujubes. It's a Japanese... It's it's a it's some uh, Asian. Call it Chinese date, but it's not related to dates. Dates come from a palm tree, and this is very clearly not a palm tree. This is a deciduous broadleaf tree. 
uh, that is very adaptable to um, drought and arid conditions. Uh, it does really well in the desert, actually. And so, like, if you want to grow a food forest, jujube is one of the perfect plants for a food forest in, in Southern California. The fruit's really good. It tastes similar to an apple. Yeah, it's very mild. Some yeah. people don't like it, but I like it. I think it's refreshing. Mm -hmm. uh, so let's get the mulch on. I want to get some gloves. Let's okay. take this compost out of the sun. Because it's going to start drying out. And remember, what does the sun have in it? What does sunlight have in it? UV radiation. What does UV radiation do to, this, to bacteria and fungi? It kills it. Kills it. <laughs> so we want to keep it in the shade. Keep it covered. This is why we keep our soil covered. If you ever have bare soil in your garden, all that life in the top of your soil is going to be killed. And you're gonna to have to rely on fertilizers, you're gonna to have to rely on pesticides, and, and you're gonna be, you know, constantly trying to, uh, you're gonna be constantly, um, like, trying to apply band-aids. Mm -hmm. So that's why we cover our soil here. That's why we plant cover crops, because it's gonna keep the soil healthy. And so that's why we're using wood chips. Yes, and to answer your question, about what I add to my tea. Um, I add just honey or sometimes agave, honey or agave to sweeten it. Um, or sometimes I'll steep the tea, let it cool down, and then make it for iced tea. I like to do that. Sometimes I'll add, actually I haven't added lemon in a while. Lemon? But yeah, someone asked what I add to my tea. Do you make tea at home, Andres? I do. I actually make sun tea. Sometimes. I love making sun tea. It's the most energy efficient way to make tea. You don't have to use any gas or any electricity to make sun tea. That's what I love about it. And yeah, I've delicious. made sun tea before too. The flavor is nice and mild, but full bodied. Mm -hmm. We're going to get wood chips on here. The, the strings are going to get covered, but that's okay. We only needed them to plant, so we don't need the strings for anything else. The what? We only needed the strings to plant. Oh, right. Yeah, so we got one variety of zucchini in here, two varieties of yellow summer squash. Uh, one of them's a crook neck and one of them's a straight neck. Is that the way it looks when you harvest it? One's, that? one's curved and one's straight. Yep. Oh, no. Sorry, little guy. Oh, look it. We left out a Oh yeah, um, that's okay. I'll, I'll plant it at home or somewhere else in the garden. You should I'd just like plant it where the chaos um, garden is. I'm gonna be growing some red uh, amaranth at my house this year. I'm gonna put it in with my uh, cover crop mix because what I'm gonna be doing in a lot of my garden at home is chaos gardening, just like in all my beds. The chaos garden you have is there, right? Yep. But I really like the idea of chaos garden because it really maximizes the utility that you get from having a diverse community of plants in your garden because they're sort of like all next to each other, you know? That's why yeah. cover crops do so well because you have a lot of different species of plants that are all growing in close proximity. <laughs> and so they're all able to benefit from each other and they're all able to communicate uh, within the rhizosphere. Yeah. And we're, we're learning more and more about how plants communicate uh, through the uh, fungal network in the soil. And so we're trying to rebuild that fungal network in the soil. It's like a literal, yeah, and, and I now, think these plants are going to be able to tap into it. I think the first time you had told me, like, I guess I never realized. I feel like this is our podcast right now. We're having, like, a plant podcast. Yeah, kind of. This is our <laughs> kind of. wellness garden podcast. And, wellness garden podcast. And, and but then, you know, you got somebody who's been, who spends hours a day studying regenerative agriculture right here. So. And then somebody who's, like, learning a bunch of stuff like me and you guys. Um, but ever since you, like brought it to my attention about the forest which is literally like think about all the jungles and everywhere in the world like do they do planting like sometimes we are think we have to do they just yeah interesting nature knows how to take care of itself yeah all we have to do in our garden is enable it <laughs> all we have to do is facilitate it that's our job as gardeners harvest yeah. And then we, and then nature will give back to us. Once we give nature what it needs, nature will give us what we need. Because we are nature. We are a part of it, and we need to act like it. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, having a nice, uh, regenerative, diverse garden where you're not using any pesticides, 
It's a good start. I can't remember the last time I used pesticides here. And like when I use pesticides, it's only on the research plots. Mm -hmm. I don't use it anywhere else here. Not even organic stuff, not even neem oil. Once you have like a diverse garden, it's yes. not necessary. You don't need to do it. And it, it does it does more harm than good oftentimes. Because the thing about pesticides is not only are you getting the pests, you're getting the good guys too. And guess what reproduces faster than the good guys? The pests. Mm. So next year, you're going to have more pests and not enough good guys. You wow, you are garden. just debunking all the garden myths out there. There's a lot of them. It's just yeah. conventional wisdom, but you know, this this is like a redis this like all of this right here is, is mm -hmm. sort of rediscovering things that people, especially indigenous people, have understood for a very long time about plants and about like uh, garden ecosystems. And we're just understanding the scientific side of it now. Science is starting to become aware of these things. Yeah. There's some, some really amazing research coming out that I've been following. Um, there's, I, I know that uh, we're, we're, we're like still discovering what actually happens in the soil. You know, we don't know much about it. You know, that's why like, you know, you don't have to know all the things that happen in the soil. All you have to know is the principles of soil health. <laughs> and now it's, it's really good to see, um, especially the uh, Natural Resources Defense Council is really starting to push this stuff. Um, and, and they're, um, the, uh, they're uh, a governmental organization here in the United States that works very closely with farmers and they're starting to push this kind of, these methods now. Hmm. And it's, it's probably been one of the best developments in recent years in this field is, is, is the government is now on board with this. One, uh, one guy that I really like who's from uh, that organization is Ray Archuleta. R-A-Y. Oh, I've heard you mention him before. -E -A. He talks all about this stuff. Yeah. He's a very good speaker too. Do you want me to finish the mulching? Yeah, you can finish the mulch. Uh, let me okay. just gather some more for you. We have about 10 minutes. We have 10 minutes? So. 20. Look at that. I'm getting mulch for my. <laughs> yeah, we're going to need to get more. Are you sure that's not enough already for the soil section? The rest of the stuff in here is just soil. Oh. Okay. It's old soil. Wear a mask when doing this, please. <laughs> Even. After COVID is done. Because <laughs> it gets very dusty. It's very dusty. It's irritating to your lungs. I've yeah. definitely had issues with coughing for doing this. That's why I'm wearing a mask. So I think we'll water this all in later after the sun goes down a bit. And we'll smooth it out. We'll get it nice and straight. We'll apply a bit extra. Make sure all the residues and compost are nice and covered. And I think it's time to get in touch with PPM and ask them for more wood chips. Because <laughs> they have plenty. Mm. They're always happy to give us wood chips, so... We're, we're, we're going to make use of these in our beds this year. This is how we save water. This is how we cover the soil and protect it when we're not doing cover crops. We use wood chips. Yeah. They're, they're one of the best things you can do to cover your soil. They're long-lived, and they feed fungi. I didn't know they feed fungi. Yeah, fungi love wood. That's what fungi do, is, is they break down the lignin in wood. Wow. Not all kinds of fungi. Yes, lignin. I remember in my nutrition class, that's the one type of uh, like fiber that we cannot break down. Yeah, so but fungi we... can. Wow. It takes them a while, but they do it. <laughs> um, type, uh, class of fungi called uh, saprophytic fungi. Mm -hmm. Not mycorrhizal fungi. Both are important. The mycorrhizal fungi are the ones that people commonly think about when they hear about like the fungal network in the soil. Those are the mycorrhizal fungi. The saprophytic fungi are decomposers. Both are important, but they have different roles to play. But both are involved in soil building. Because soil is built by two main mechanisms. One is through decomposition, which we all learned about in our uh, seventh grade biology class. And the other is called the liquid carbon pathway. And this is new science. It's when um, plants actually take four, about 40%, I think 40 to 60% of the sugars they produce and pump it down into the soil through the roots to feed the bacteria and fungi that live in the soil in the rhizosheaths that we just showed you. So the bacteria and fungi that are in these rhizosheaths are being fed with sugars and amino acids from the plants that they produce with photosynthesis. 
Wow. And uh, who would have ever known? That's actually the most important <laughs> method for getting carbon into the soil from bare soil. That's what gets it started, the liquid carbon pathway. It, uh, these uh, compounds that uh, they exude into the soil, the plants are called root exudates. And uh, you know what happens when you apply chemical fertilizers? You kill it, that. It disrupts the whole process. Oh. Because then the plants get lazy and they don't need to do that. They don't need to work for their nutrients because it's the bacteria and fungi that are able to get the nutrients out of the sand, the silt, and the clay in the soil. The plants can't do that. So if you then give the plants the nutrients, then the bacteria, they, they, the bacteria don't get fed. The plants just eat up all the ammonia and the nitrate you're adding. So, and the thing is, you know, it's inorganic nitrogen that, that I'm talking about here. And just because a fertilizer is called organic, that doesn't mean it has, it doesn't have inorganic fertilizer in it or inorganic nutrients. Like manures have inorganic nitrogen. That's why manures aren't the best thing unless you compost them. You can actually burn your plants. Okay. I did not know that. I thought organic was organic and that's it. Organic in, in that sense is a regulatory term. Mm -hmm. it, it's, it, it's a legal term. It's not a term that describes, like when I say inorganic versus organic nitrogen or inorganic versus organic phosphorus, Mm -hmm. What that, what I mean in that sense is, is chemical, the chemical sense. Because like, organic chemicals are carbon, are complex carbon-containing compounds. Inorganic, inorganic chemicals are simple compounds that really aren't carbon-based. Like ammonia, for example. Ammonia is NH4 or NH3. Ammonium is NH4 plus. And yes. those are those that are not inorganic in nitrogen. And fertilize and uh, manure that hasn't been composted contains that stuff. So. Um, even though manure is labeled as organic, if you apply uncomposted manure to your soil, you're applying inorganic nitrogen. Wow. And that disrupts the process. And uh, it was uh, Dr. Christine Jones who spoke of this on a uh, webinar that I watched recently. Dr. Christine Jones is an Australian soil scientist. Soil uh, scientist, that's a thing. Oh, absolutely. I did not, I soil thought I was thinking chemist or something. Soil microbiologist. Soil without biology is just geology and chemistry. Right. It's not soil, it's dirt. We want soil. We want we want something that's alive. That's what we're trying to do here. Alright, we're, we're getting nice and uh and this is all gonna settle. The mulch is gonna settle after we water it in. Right. Um five minutes. Five minutes? Yeah. Um let's leave some time for QA. Oh yeah. Um, Is there any questions anybody has? I, I know, and we can finish this after. I want to take lunch and then finish this on a clip. After this. I'm hungry. I'm a hungry boy. I don't think there's any questions. I think no it's questions. just Alondra here. Alondra, do you have any questions? <laughs> <laughs> this Looking is wonderful good. though. So glad we finally were able to get this done. So corners is the sun we'll flowers. We'll put sunflower on those ends and, and maybe like some marigolds or something else on that end. Or maybe some like mixed herbs. The Mexican sunflower, right? No, um, the Mexican sunflower is going to go in the ground by the fruit trees. Oh, okay. Because uh, what that will do... Um, uh, so Mexican sunflower is, is something that um, I've been wanting to bring here for since last weekend and since I was given cuttings by... Um, uh, my friend Johnny Allen at the Birdhouse in Hollywood. Check out the Birdhouse. It's an amazing place. It's a permaculture food forest right in the middle of Hollywood, right below the Hollywood sign. Um, and uh, so um, I was given these cuttings of this plant called Tithonia or Mexican sunflower. It's like a bush sunflower, right? It has like these really beautiful uh, leaves um, that, that are like lobed and everything. Uh, and it grows really, really fast, and you could just keep cutting it back and cutting it back and cutting it back. And um, its value as a fertilizer is, is almost like a manure, but wow. it's organic fertilizer, like in a chemical sense, because it's because all the nutrients are in the plant tissue. And so you chop it and drop it like we did here, underneath your and and put the residue underneath your fruit trees, and it builds soil. Wow, that's amazing. Who would have ever thought a sunflower could do all that? Yeah, it's, it's just it's just really good at pulling nutrients yeah. out of the soil. It's so that's what trees need. Yep. Because yeah. trees aren't... A lot of the trees we want to grow to eat the fruit off of are not as good at doing that. 
And so this is what we can use instead of the fertilizer we applied the other week. Getting mm -hmm. plants like this in there. Another one that uh, we're going to be bringing is called comfrey. Mm, um, and we're going to be putting those comfrey. underneath the trees. But um, yeah, the tithonia is going to be um, a you uh, said it's perennial, larger, right? It's a perennial, yes. Yay. I'm not sure how long it can live for, but a very long time for sure. Like years and years. Um, and uh, you, it, you, it will get to like 20 feet tall if you let it. But we're going to keep it to around 5, 6 feet here. By cutting it back. <laughs> okay, 20 I might feet bring tall. A one and put it over there too. That's uh, wonderful, and it even matches like the MMC logo. Exactly. <laughs> sunflower. Exactly, and we're Sun also going to be growing sunchokes in that bed, which are again oh, a sunflower. Nice and sunchokes are a sunflower that produce tubers like potatoes. That you can eat. The sunflowers? Yeah, sunchokes. Oh, That's why sunchokes. I got the sunchokes because you know it's like the MMC logo, but because it's a sunflower. But it's also going to produce edible tubers that are supposed <laughs> that supposed to t are supposed to taste like water chestnuts. Okay, I've tasted water chestnuts before. Yeah, and they'll Yummy. they'll get as tall as the lime tree for sure <laughs> if 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 they're doing really well. We okay. might need to cut them back a little bit. Alrighty, are well we it's wrapping it up. Two o'clock. We have one more minute, but I'll just take this time to. Um, share about like some programming that we have at the MMC. So we have our weekly, um, we just start, we're gonna start a new series of the weight management workshop. And that one is gonna have just, it's a lot of um, just that basic nutrition education that's gonna really build your foundation for learning how to eat healthier and creating those healthy habits. Um, so that is starting tomorrow. And it's going to be every Friday for the next six weeks, I believe, at 1 nice. o'clock from 1 to 2. And I am helping teach those workshops with one of the MMC project coordinators, Janika. And, yeah, I just wanted to share about that. And then we also have our Ask a Master Gardener feature um, on the MMC website where you can put in your gardening questions and someone who is well knowledgeable about gardening can help and assist you with whatever questions you have and that is about it I think we are concluding our our live here all right thank you for tuning in everyone all right. thank you I don't even know if I'm showing anything <laughs> yes we will see you next week See you next week, everyone. Bye. Bye-bye.